Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Morgan's Pop Talks. I am your host, Morgan, and I am so excited to get into today's episode. We have some good stuff for you. A winter house conspiracy theory, the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. We have bachelor engagements. We got to talk about love is blind. But before we get into it, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who has joined my Patreon page. We're officially a weekend and I want to explain a little bit better what the Patreon is because I don't think I did a good job of that. I actually had one of my friends text me and they were like, what's a Patreon? <laughs> so I should probably explain. So as you guys know, once a week, the MPT is free for all my sisters to enjoy, to send to friends, to just live your best life in. If you want more than one episode a week, I am now doing mini episodes on Patreon for $5 a month. So instead of just one episode, you'll get three episodes a week for five bucks a month total. Um, If you want to support me and my journey to be a full-time I don't even really know what it is that I want to be. Like, do I want to be a full-time podcaster? I'm not an influencer. Ugh, I don't like using that word to describe myself. I also don't make enough money on advertisements to be considered an influencer, but I like talking to you guys. So if you want to support me and my journey, if you want more exclusive content, you got to go to patreon.com. I'm going to link it in my show in my show notes below too, but it's patreon.com slash uh, Morgan's pop talks. And I'm just going to give you a little teaser for what's coming tomorrow on the Patreon. I'm calling it the bachelor brain dump because, oh my God, have you heard the stuff that's going on this week? Not only tomorrow on the Patreon are we going to talk about everything that happened this week on Bachelor in Paradise, but there's some major, and I mean major, tea going on in the Bachelor universe right now. I also think one of the contestants might be throwing some shade at me. Um, so make sure you stay tuned tomorrow on the Patreon to find out about that. Like I said, uh, the description is in the show notes if you want to check it out. But let's get into what you're here for. That would be this week's pop three. These are the biggest headlines in reality TV and pop culture. Bachelor engagements. We had two question mark engagements this week. It's either two or zero, honestly. Like that's how confused I am about these engagements. Let's start with Dean and Kaylin. Apparently, Dean and Kaylin got engaged, although they haven't officially announced it anywhere, anywhere, which I think is kind of um, weird. But I also think everything they do is a little weird. Um, so on brand, essentially what happened was on Dean's podcast, which is called Help I Suck at Dating, um, they said, by the time this podcast episode is out, we will be engaged. Okay, and the episode's out, so... I guess they're <laughs> engaged. And also um, Jared, the co-host of that podcast, posted on his Instagram, like, congratulations to you two. So I guess, I mean, it was in People Magazine. Y'all know if a bachelor couple gets engaged, they're going straight to people. They got them on speed dial for the people exclusive. So then there's the whole saga, you know, that's been going on about Dean buying a ring for Kaylin. Um, if you don't know, they met on Bachelor in Paradise. Uh, they didn't make it to the finale episode, but they left together early. And Dean has said some things that have raised some eyebrows around proposing to Kaylin, buying her a ring. Essentially, he's like, if you want a ring, Kaylin, I want you to buy me a truck. It's a choice. Well, he revealed that he got Kaylin a ring then lost it and then bought another ring. And then Kaylin was on her Instagram story. Like I'm at the Toyota dealership. So I'm thinking that she got him a truck. Here's the thing. He said he got a new placeholder engagement ring for Kaylin after mistakenly losing the original one, which was 4.5 carat emerald cut diamond. He said it might be in the garage somewhere, but yeah, moral of the story is don't put your engagement rings in the junk drawer. So I did have to go out and buy a placeholder ring for now, but it's not quite as nice as the first one was. This made me so mad. Not, not even because he lost the ring, the whole argument around the fact that Kaylin was supposed to buy Dina trunk, a, a trunk, <laughs> Yeah, just the trunk. No, the whole argument around Kaylin having to buy Dean the truck was he was like, 
Kaylin makes a lot more money than me. Why should I have to shell out X amount of dollars for an expensive engagement ring? And then you buy a 4.5 carat ring, you put it in a junk drawer and you lose it. Like, really, Dean? Really? You're going to complain? I don't even know if he was complaining. You're going to make the argument that Kaylin should buy you a truck because she makes more money. And then you're going to lose a 4.5 carat ring in the junk drawer. Okay. And I get the sentiment, right? You know, they're just addressing the gender roles, what have you. My thing is, if I were Kaylin, I would not want to have to deal with that for the rest of my life. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's one thing. Is it one thing? I don't know. I just know that my fiance is the greatest, most loving. I mean, he goes above and beyond for me, always wants to help for me. He never expects anything in return. So I just feel like, oh, having to deal with that mentality for the rest of your life might be a little rough, but Godspeed to you. Fingers crossed that Dean and Kaylin, that this will live happily ever after in their new truck. And hopefully one day they find the engagement ring that was in the garage in the junk drawer. Becca and Thomas, Becca and Thomas also got engaged again. So last time Becca proposed to Thomas, this time Thomas proposed to Becca. You guys, can you tell? I'm over these people. I am over it. It seems like anything to get a people exclusive, anything to get on the Daily Mail, like they're going to do it. Take a photo shoot, get some money. I've had enough. I've had enough. What was it? Ari and Lauren got engaged like three different times. And every single time they acted like it was the first time. It's not the first time. Okay. I'm going to get off my soapbox there. And we're going to move on to something lighter. Kylie and Travis cheating rumors about Travis. So according to TMZ, Travis Scott was on set directing a music video last week. We know this because there's a blurry video of him directing. He's not denying that, but he is denying almost everything else about the story surrounding it, including rumors that he has been cheating on Kylie Jenner. So the video was posted on Instagram by a woman named Rogine Carr, who he allegedly hooked up with way back before he and Kylie Jenner met and started dating. Um, after the video went public, though, this is where it gets interesting. Travis had a complete other take on the matter. He denied any knowledge of her being on the set if she was actually there denying they were ever a thing he said on his instagram an uninvited person was sneaking photos on what was supposed to be a closed set while i was directing a video i am saying this for the last time i don't know this person i've never been with this person well that really ticked the girl off who claims to have all the receipts and posted videos saying travis is full of it and here's like what is known as fact, Travis never publicly said that they were dating when they first got linked in 2013, but they have definitely posted pictures and videos together. No time like within the, the recent future, but they're out there. You can't deny, you can't live in la la land. Travis Scott, these photos are out there. Okay. There were even rumors that this woman was at the center of Travis and Kylie's 2019 split, but even Rogine denied that but his take on the whole thing is that it's continuous cyber games and fictional storytelling i saw this on the tiktok right before i jumped on the pod remember that interview um that travis and kylie did together and travis knew nothing about kylie jenner like while they were dating didn't know her dog's names she was like you don't you don't know my dog's name like one of them's name is dog i don't know if that's it was like that level you don't know anything about my life are you able to sneak on a set? I don't know. I've never tried. I did sneak in the SVIP line at BravoCon though. So I have some experience sneaking into places that I don't belong. It's doable. It's nerve wracking as heck too, but 
it's doable. So coming in at number three in this week's pop three, we have Luke versus Craig on Winter House season two. Things came to a head on episode two of Winter House. Um, a lot of alcohol is involved in Winter House, as it always is. And we end the last episode, and we're getting another episode tonight of this huge fight between Luke versus Craig um, about Luke being maybe a little bit too touchy-feely towards some of the women. Now, this triggered a memory for me because I wrote this article in November of 2021, almost a year ago, before Winter House even filmed. They started filming in February, and the title of this article was called I'm Convinced Craig Conover and Luke Goldbranson Hate Each Other. It all started when Craig was on Watch What Happens Live and Andy asked him to give out spoiler superlative. Andy asked Craig, who has the biggest ego of the group? And Craig's response was, Luke thinks highly of himself. Then a week later, humble brag, Luke came on my show right here on NPT and said that he thought Craig was projecting. Now on the show, they say the whole fight was over fireworks, but you know I always have a theory. And this is where my conspiracy theory comes in. There was a blind item sent into Dumois before Craig and Paige were officially dating. And this is what it said. Paige and Craig are deaf, not dating. She was all over Luke from Summer House at Kygo Sunday night. This was in the summer. I even asked Luke about that blind item DM. And what he said was he didn't confirm or deny. He was like, if Paige wants to hang all over me, she's more than welcome to do so. Something along those lines. This was never confirmed by anyone. And while I don't think that Luke and Paige ever hooked up, I do find it very suspicious that Craig and Luke are now fighting about Luke being too touchy. Six months after that blind item came out about Luke possibly being a little too touchy with Paige at Palm Tree Festival. And what set Craig off instantly? As soon as Luke touched Paige's head, was it her head? Was it her leg? I can't remember. Instantly, Craig was like, get out of the house. And Luke left. I'm just saying, you know, I love a conspiracy theory. Okay, let's move on to this week's deep dive. As you know, for the people, by the people, every single week on my Instagram page at Morgan P Talks, I open up the floodgates. What is it that you want to know more about? And of course, <laughs> are we not exhausted by Lisa Rinna? Oh my gosh. But I got to give the people what they want. This week's deep dive question comes to us from Charlie. Hey Morgan, this is Charlie from McAllister, Oklahoma. We need a deep dive on all things Lisa Renna, the fake Twitter accounts, the posts she was sharing. Do you think she's going to be put on pause? I know this has to have pushed Kyle over the edge, wanting to know what's going to happen with everything she's been up to. I love your pod. I listen to it every single week. Love you like a sis. Thank you, Charlie. Love you like a sis. We'll just get into it all. All of it, every last bit this weekend was a wild one from Lisa Renna. Who would have thought that the woman that was completely edited out of the first half of the season of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills would be the talk of the town? I mean, have we talked about anything except for Lisa Renna for the past like month? It started this weekend. She got major backlash after posting about Paris Hilton's abuse, all in an effort to get back at Kathy Hilton for Kathy Hilton calling her a bully, which we saw on the final part of the Beverly Hills reunion. So we're going to get down a real wormhole here. So just buckle yourself on up um, because it started when Lisa Renna reposted this tweet from Woke Batty. Remember the name. I mean, how could you forget a name like that? But remember the name. It was a meme and it said, Kathy to Lisa, you're the biggest bully in Hollywood. And then it said me to Kathy. You're the mother that had her daughter kidnapped in the middle of the night, which led her to being abused, raped, and you never apologized to her when she confronted you about it. Hashtag RHOB. Lisa Renner reposted that. I said on my Instagram story that's disgusting on Lisa's part to repost that. And I had some people in my DMs be like, well, it's true. A, 
it's only Paris's story to tell first and foremost. B, I mean, I followed the story pretty closely. I watched the documentary. I could have missed something, but I don't ever remember her giving, you know, those explicit details about what happened. I mean, I know that she was abused. I know she was taken in the middle of the night, but still probably should not speculate on those kinds of things. And Lisa Renna was the one who said no kids. She threatened Garcelle with legal action about Garcelle's book in which Garcelle was literally referencing something that was said on the show that the world had all already seen no new information. And Lisa like called her lawyers and made Garcelle change the book. But Lisa Renner, you're okay to say that about Paris. My thing is Lisa, like, I know she's not listening to me, but I wrote it as if she was, you don't know, Lisa, what kind of combos Paris and Kathy had behind closed doors. You don't know if Kathy apologized for whatever. Maybe not on the documentary, but, you know, their whole entire life wasn't on the documentary. And it's none of Lisa Renna's business, point blank, period. And, you know, Paris was liking all kinds of tweets in her mother's defense. She was tweeting things. Um, a video that Kathy did at BravoCon, she quote tweeted and was like, I love you, mom. So, I mean, Paris has spoken openly about the abuse that she endured uh, while she was at Provo Canyon Academy. You know, in the documentary, it's called This is Paris. If you want to watch it, it's really good. It focused entirely on her experience. But it's like, Lisa Renna, we just got done watching part two, where the majority of the time, all that was talked about was, this is just a TV show. Leave our kids and our family alone. It was in reference to Garcelle's son, Jax, in being harassed online. But what difference is it? In Lisa Renna going after Paris. Lisa, this is just a TV show. Leave the kids and their abuse out of it. It is none of your business. I just think it's like the lowest of the low. And I always was giving Lisa the benefit of the doubt throughout the entire season because I have empathy for people. I always try to look at like, what is this person going through to make them act in such a way. And, you know, losing Lois was probably devastating for Lisa. And there are moments in the season where I'm like, oh, Lisa is, she is a part of the fabric of Beverly Hills. I had moments where I thought that. And then you have moments like this and you're just like, ugh, it's disgusting. I think it's disgusting. So remember Woke Baddie? Told you not to forget the name. Hope you didn't. Who could? People started to think that Woke Batty, the person that wrote that DM, was actually Lisa Renna herself. So the story is, allegedly, Lisa Renna made this fake account to, you know, constantly come to her and Erica's defense. There are some interesting things when you look at this account, like Erica follows the account. Um, it's not big by any means. So the fact that Erica Jane, like, saw it and follows it is kind of bizarre. Um there were some Instagram accounts saying they looked up like the location of where it was coming from, that the coordinates match Lisa Renna's house. Look, I don't know if all that's true. It seems like a little bit of a stretch for me. And you know, I love a conspiracy theory. That's like next level conspiracy theory. I don't know if I'm there all the way. And also that Instagram page talks about other shows, I think like Married to Medicine and The Real Housewives of Atlanta. So it's like, do you think that Lisa Renna is sitting around binge watching every Bravo show? I just don't think so. Um, also this week, there were some headlines saying that Lisa Renna's publicist dropped her. According to Teddy, it was actually Lisa that severed the relationship with her publicist. And according to Teddy, this is what Lisa told her. She said, quote, Jill and I parted ways. I didn't want to be represented by someone who represents Paris Hilton, Bethany Frankel, and Denise Richards any longer. Really? Who cares? I mean, really? Who cares? It's got nothing to do with you, Lisa. So I also don't buy that. Like, they've been... They've been representing Denise Richards. They've been representing Bethany Frankel. And now, all of a sudden, what does Lisa have to do with Bethany Frankel? Oh, my God. This stuff never stops. So there were some other things that come out about, you know, Lisa Renna's alleged online activity. One being a photo allegedly from Lisa's Instagram story of Lisa, like, creepily smiling 
holding a gun and threatening marketing manager. That's an air quotes because I don't even know who this dude is. Patrick Somers. The photo is captioned when I find me Patrick. Patrick and Lisa had drama earlier this year when he claimed he and Rinna were behind orchestrating an attack on Kathy Hilton. Lisa's new publicist? Question mark. I have no idea. It's just when I looked up on Radar Online. I'm sorry. Anytime I see Radar Online, I cannot say it in any other voice but my Lisa Vanderpump voice. So hopefully I did a good job. According to Radar Online, her publicist, Jeffrey Chasen, said, Lisa is far too busy long, launching two highly anticipated businesses to be involved in erroneous cyber activity. Lisa only works from her lisarena.com server. Um, Jeffrey says in Lisa's defense, I have no idea who this person is and we're not interested in partaking in his childish nonsense. He's been harassing Lisa for months. We won't give this person any more attention. Patrick Somers, who in the heck is this guy? And he, he did something right. I don't know what's going on with him, how he's involved, how he snuck his way in here. I don't even know who he is really, but man, we've talked about him a lot for somebody that I know literally nothing about. He is as much a part of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills as Lucy, Lucy, Apple Juicy at this point. Patrick Somers, who would have thunk it? He's getting a lot of attention. So then part three of the reunion, of course, was last night. And I don't know if you guys saw Kyle Richards' Instagram story yesterday. It seems like a farewell post to me. Let me pull it up because you know I got it on my Instagram story. boop ba doop ba doo and this is me stalling till I got it. Here it is. Kyle Richards, 18, says, it's just a show, they said. It'll be fun, they said. Tonight, the reunion part three is here. Thank you for watching this season. It's been rough, no doubt. There have been good times and bad times. As I walk away from the season, I will try to focus on the good. Thank you for being supportive and calling me out when needed. I appreciate both. There are always lessons to be learned during challenging times. I like to believe we can all grow from these experiences. I now, nope, I know I learn and grow from each season. Now I'm looking forward to it being over and moving on. Much love, Kyle. I think she's done, y'all. I think Mauricio has his new Netflix show. It's basically selling Sunset, but in Beverly Hills, and the agency is the Oppenheim Group. I think, I think this might be it. Although I also think that Kyle Richards might have some identity attachment to Beverly Hills because she's been on it for so long. It's almost like Tom Brady, you know, like he wants to retire from football, and then he has this identity crisis. Who am I without? The Green Bay Packers. I know he doesn't pay for the plaque. I pay play for the Packers. Yeah. Where is he? Play? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Kyle Richards might be having her football crisis right now. She might be having her Real Housewives Beverly Hills crisis. Who is she without the show? She's an actress. She's a mom. She's a boss. Anyways, that was a tangent. Um, like I was saying, part three of the reunion last night. You know, I'm a week behind, but from everything I've seen online, it comes out from Erica Jane that Kathy used a homophobic slur in Aspen, and that's what the big, you know, kerfluffle is about. Obviously, Kathy Hilton vehemently denies it. Um, they say, at least from everything I've read, that it was in regards to Sutton Strack's assistant, and even Sutton is like, no, that didn't happen. I want to squash untruths. Um, my assistant wasn't even in Aspen. So I think this whole thing is ridiculous. I don't know. We'll see. Like I said, I haven't actually watched the episode yet. This is all just from things that I've seen online. So do I think Rena will be put on pause? I think this is interesting because my gut reaction is to say yes, because I see a lot of similarities to when Dorinda was put on pause. You know, everybody was like, Dorinda is very angry. She's very easily agitated. She needs to take a break. This is too much. And everybody has the same complaints right now about Lisa Renna. But when you see the road that Roni went down after Dorinda and then the domino effect that was the later seasons. I don't know if they're going to go down that road again. You know what I'm saying? Kathy is a friend of, and you know, I forgot to mention this, but I think Kathy Hilton lit this whole fire 
with Lisa Renna and her social media this past weekend because she said, if Erica and Lisa come back, I'm not coming back. And if you were at BravoCon, you, the people loved Kathy Hiltz. She was getting standing ovations. People were chanting her name. She is really doing something in the franchise. And I don't think anybody was ex anybody on the show currently was expecting her to be as popular as she is. And I think that might scare Lisa Renna to think, okay, she might actually have some pull here because the audience really does like her. Has a friend of ever had that kind of leverage? No, they haven't, which is why I don't know. If I had to take a guess, I would say that Kathy will stay on as a friend of Lisa will be put on pause for one season and Erica Jane will remain a full time cast member. I know a lot of people don't like that either because I think Erica should be the one to go. But at the end of the day, her situation right now makes for good TV. And what does Bravo care about making good TV? So that's my prediction. We'll see how this goes. I'm glad this season is coming to an end. I enjoyed it, though. I thought it was, like, really entertaining. It was, it was pretty rough, though. It was pretty brutal. Speaking of brutal, I want to wrap things up by talking about season three of Love is Blind is officially here. Now, I just started watching. I'm only three and a half episodes in, so I'm just going to give you my brief thoughts, and then maybe once I get through the whole season, I'll do, like, a little Patreon special for you guys. This season truly unhinged. The editing, though, has gotten a lot better, in my opinion, because I think the episodes flow better. They move faster. One of my major complaints last season was like, ugh, I had to fast forward through so many parts because I just didn't care. But, you know, we're already, even like two episodes in, we already knew everybody who was engaged. They were getting ready to go. It's their little Richie, whatever. Um, let's start with Andrew. Oh, my Lord sakes almighty, Andrew. I... Kit, I'm self-aware enough to know I'm not the smartest person in the room. I'm not the brightest crayon in the box. But everything Andrew says goes right over my head. Like, whoop. I don't know what you're trying to say, Andrew. Like, about anything. Ever. And then he has the eye drop moment where, you know, he... I don't want to spoil it, though. Okay, I'll try not to spoil it as much as possible. There's one moment where... He puts eye drops in because something happens to make him appear to be more sad. David and I looked at each other like, are we in the twilight zone? And I saw somebody ask, like, why do you think um, couples from season one worked out so much better than couples from season two? And now we're seeing a lot of it in season three. The show is huge. It's massively successful. So a lot of people really want. I think screen time, which brings me to my next person that I'm really unsure about. That's Raven. Doing jumping jacks while my dude is like being vulnerable, talking about one of the most life-changing moments. She's like doing bicep crawls in the, in the corner. She did address it. She said, editing is always a factor, but I'm going to own up to it. It was horrible. It was a horrible time to do jumping jacks. Girl, like, unless you're in the gym or in your house by yourself not having a conversation, like, save the jumping jacks. You don't have your phone in there, girl. I don't even know if they can watch TV. You have all the live long day to do jumping jacks. Not while Bartise is telling you about the beginning of the end of his parents' marriage, Raven. So let's go through the existing couples. And like I said, if you haven't watched it yet, you don't know who's engaged, leave now. Three, two, one. We're going to start now, okay? Okay. Brennan and Alexa. Three and a half episodes in. Alexa's one of my favorite. Alexa is a real one. I would have fun with Alexa. She's chill. She's funny. She seems normal. Brennan's like country boy, which is a hard note for me, but I'm not the one engaged to him, so what does it matter? I think they're cute together. I think they're the most normal couple. They haven't got the most screen time, which normally means there's not a lot of drama between them. So I'm banking on them making it out alive. Matt and Colleen, immediately no. Immediately no. I've seen what I needed to see. <sighs> the ballet dancer, Colleen, just doesn't seem ready for marriage for me. She seems like one of those people that wants to be on TV. She said she didn't like having deep relationships, my girl. <laughs> and then she turned around and was like, she was like, I don't like deep relationships. I like being really shallow. 
And then she comes back and she's like, he rejected me. Sis, honey, that ain't what happened. You pretty much told him you weren't ready to be a wife. What do you expect is going to happen? Speaking of Bartise, we have Bartise and Nancy. I just do not see that lasting for some reason. I can't put my finger on why there is a five year age difference, which to me isn't that big of a deal um, in my mind. But Nancy seemed to be a little bit worried about it. And I heard some whisperings that another lady might catch the eye of Bartise and things might start to go downhill. But I'm not there yet. So don't spoil it for me. I won't spoil it for you. OK, uh, Zeneb and Cole. Zeneb is another favorite for me. Cole, not so much. Cole's mannerisms. Um, I'm trying to think of a nice way to put it because there's no really nice way to say that. It, it comes off extremely immature to me. Like, I don't know why, and this might not make any sense, but I don't see Cole as like a real person. I see him as a cartoon character. You know? Like, he kind of reminds me a little bit of the Tasmanian devil, a little bit. Like just zipping around. Everything's really fast and frantic. I don't know. I also don't have high hopes for these two. They just don't seem very compatible. And then we have SK and Raven. I think the worst pairing of the whole entire situation. Raven is going to eat SK alive. And I said it before, I'll say it again. This might sound really mean, but I think Raven wants the screen time. I think that's why she said yes to SK's proposal. I don't know. I just don't trust it. And SK is just like the purest, cutest little soul. I just think that that one's going to end badly. My prediction is that one couple will say I do at the altar, and that couple is Brennan and Alexa. I think we're going to have some swapping going on, but I won't say who because I don't want to ruin the episode. But like I said, as soon as I get all the way through Love is Blind, we'll do a Patreon exclusive for you. And that is where we will end it. Don't forget to check out the Patreon, please. If you want to support me and my journey to not have to have six jobs to pay my rent, I love it. $5 a month, you get two mini-sodes a week. It's like an additional eight to 10 episodes a week. So check it out. Uh, Patreon.com slash Morgan's Pop Talks. It's in the show notes as well. And we'll see you back here next. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I talked to Craig. Don't spam him in the comments yet because he's working on it. Maybe next week. Although I also feel like I've been down this road one too many times with Craig. So I don't really know if it's going to happen. But he's telling me that it is going to happen. And I'm going to, I already got my first questions for him. Do you know how to clean? Do you have the thousand dollars? on you right now. Do you think you're the most popular person on Bravo? I'm going to ask him. If he comes on, he says he's waiting on Bravo to clear it. So fingers crossed. If you haven't left a review yet, make sure you do so. A boop, boop, five-star rating. You're crystal clear. You're out of here. See you next week. Love you like a sis.